Okay, we will open the public hearing, which or the public meeting, which is the regularly scheduled meeting of the Transportation Public Works Committee. Uh, I'm Councilman Reich. I will be chairing the committee. I'm joined by Councilman Bender. We are not a quorum of the committee and will not be conducting uh, actionable items uh, on, on the agenda presented, but we do have the opportunity to have a presentation and we wanted to take advantage of that. So what I will do is I will get into uh, item one, uh, Director Hutchinson. Mr. Chair and um, member of the committee, uh, I will ask Jeff Handelin with Transportation Engineering and Design to present our first item, which is a public hearing on the sale of city-owned land at 501 11th Avenue South to Timeshare Systems. Thank you, Mr. Chair, member of the committee. My name is Jeff Handeland. I'm a principal professional engineer in the Transportation Engineering Design Division of the Department of Public Works. This is a public hearing and request for City Council to authorize conveyance of a city owned parcel to the adjoining property owner. There's a roughly triangular shaped piece of property uh, southeast of, on the southeast corner of the intersection of 11th Avenue and 5th Street South, which the city owns in fee title and which used to be occupied by a portion of 5th Street. That portion of 5th Street has been removed and the city engineer has determined that the parcel is no longer needed for municipal operations. The owner of the adjacent property, Timeshare Systems, has offered to purchase the property for the appraised value of $115,000. And the Planning Commission has recommended that City Council through its Zoning and Planning Committee should vacate portion of city right-of-way corresponding to the parcel. The request before you is to authorize proper city officials to convey the property by executing a quick claim deed to timeshare systems for the sale price of $115,000. I'll stay near the podium in case there's any questions. I don't see any questions. For the presentation, I will open the public hearing. Uh, anyone wish to come forward? Anyone wish to come forward and make comment? Um, so I'm opening the public hearing to receive testimony, noting that the committee members not in attendance will have the opportunity to view the meeting video prior to the committee acting on this item and the adjourned meeting on Thursday, July 13th at 1.30 p.m. Um, the public hearing will be continued uh, to the adjourned meeting. Thank you. Now we do have a presentation on item 10. Mr. Chair and uh, member of the committee, Council Member Bender. Um, Kathleen Mayell with our Transportation Planning and Programming Division has been on our behalf leading our effort on the topic of shared use mobility. We were lucky enough to be a selected city for a more in-depth study and recommendations by some partner agencies who have taken an interest in, in the topic here and we've worked collaboratively with other partners in the region to um, increase our understanding of both the opportunities as well as some of the pressures facing us. So Kathleen's going to introduce the topic and pass it over to some uh, guests who are here who will also present. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chair, committee member. My name is Kathleen Mayle. I'm a supervisor, transportation planner in the Transportation Planning and Programming Division of Public Works. And I just wanted to give a little bit of background on the Shared Use Mobility Center, which is the um, organization who is putting forth this plan. The Shared Use Mobility Center is referred to as SUMC acronym. It's a Chicago-based nonprofit with a mission to foster collaboration and shared mobility. This includes things like bike share, car sharing, ride sharing, and more. And also helping to grow the industry with transit agencies, cities, and communities around the nation. They pilot pro programs, conduct research, and provide advice and expertise to cities and regions. And through that work, they hope to extend the benefits of shared mobility to all. Last year, SUMC was funded through the McKnight Foundation to work with a host of regional stakeholders to produce the Shared Mobility Action Plan for the Twin Cities. 
we supported, Public Works supported um, this work through interviews, review, and collaboration on the effort. And in particular, traffic and parking services, as well as transportation planning and programming were involved in this effort. This model of producing a shared mobility action plan has been done once before in the nation in LA. That was done last year. SUMC has received additional funding from McKnight to support the implementation of this plan through convening a regional implementation working group throughout the coming year. The plan will be released later this month and available for public viewing at that time. And now I'd like to introduce Creighton Randall, who is the Program and Development Director at SUMC to go through the presentation. Thank you. Good morning, welcome. Good morning. Thank you, Kathleen, and, and thank you, Chair and, and Council Member, uh, for the opportunity to present. So, um, as, as Kathleen said, we started this process just over a year ago. Um, really, uh, the, the uh, inception of this uh, conversation started with the Smart Cities application led, led by city staff, uh, John Wurches in, in particular, um, to, to look at how the Twin Cities could be competitive for a large, basically a large federal uh, project um, around some of these issues. So um, just a little bit of background on that. So as we move forward um, with McKnight's interest and also with Metro Transit's interest around a, um, a, a, an app that would combine these services, um, we really we really started to, to jump into the details. So I'm going to give a little bit of overview of uh, just background on shared mobility, um, what, we've, what we've learned over the last year, and uh, some of our recommendations. So some see, uh, as Kathleen mentioned, we do a, a bunch of different things. Uh, we um, we connect the public pu public agencies and, and transit with um, with the shared mobility industry uh, and with uh, um, nonprofit organizations, community based organizations. We have a toolkit so on our website, sharedusemobilitycenter.org. We've got a lot of best practices and policy information on the industry, and um, we we do some research for the federal government on the impacts of these services. We also provide technical assistance in this case. Uh, action plan for the Twin Cities. Um, we also uh, do some work in terms of pilot projects. So started this process, as I said, about actually 15 months ago now. We've done three stakeholder workshops. These have been mostly uh, public sector professionals, some community-based organizations, uh, but uh, we've, we've had about 150 people or so in these workshops. We've done over 85 interviews, um, and we're now in the design stage of the plan. So it's a draft final. Um, if you're interested in, in, in look, looking at the draft, we'd, we'd like to provide that. Um, but we're in the sort of design phase and expect it to be public by the end of the month. Um, so just a little bit of background on what we mean by shared mobility. So we define shared mobility as anything that um, supports public transit as a backbone. So that can be car sharing, bike sharing, services like Uber and Lyft, taxis, uh, but also sort of the emerging space of, of microtransit, which is sort of an imprecise term, but really refers to any small vehicles that can provide uh, perhaps late night service or service at, at times of day or times of week that it's difficult for uh, public transit to provide. Uh, there's also sort of the, the, the physical definition of bringing all these services together through through uh, what we what we call mobility hubs, a location where you can access a bunch of different services and really has an impact on people's ability to navigate uh, the city without without uh, needing to own a car. So I won't spend too much time on these trends, but uh, as you all know, there's a lot happening in this industry right now, from autonomous vehicles to you know innovations around paratransit um, delivery and, and driving those costs down, uh, to uh, partnerships with transportation network companies um, uh, around, around service delivery, uh, one of the things near and dear to my heart is, is electric vehicle car sharing. I'll, I'll just spend just a sec talking about that. Um, but also a lot of movement around you know, integration of trips and, and actually the payment of trips, whether it's by a single card or by, a, by an app. Um, so part of what's driving this is the auto industry. Auto industry has made very significant investments in this space. Um, every major automaker has um, has made some type of investment. Uh, very different strategies coming from Daimler and Ford and General Motors, um, but everybody's sort of gotten into the space, uh, many with a view towards autonomous vehicles, of course. What we think this is doing for the space for shared mobility is it's, it's changing the definition of um, 
of, 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 of a car of transportation from something that really for most for most Americans it, it equates with ownership to something that's more of a utility we think there's a real opportunity for the public sector to define to, to help define what that utility is and and um, who, who, who service is delivered to so one example of that is a pilot project we're working on in Los Angeles where we're focused on so working with the city of LA uh, focused on disadvantaged communities in central Los Angeles with a very clear goal in terms of who this is going to serve at what price points and uh, with some pretty significant private sector funding at the table so this is this is kind of a new concept right that that a city would take a hands-on approach to um, essentially owning the system because uh, infrastructure is in the public right-of-way uh, essentially this this is a this is a public public system of car sharing I mean, we're seeing more and more examples of that. Whereas at the sort of surface level, public-private partnerships and shared mobility tend to be around things like, I'd say, low-hanging fruit, right? Like the ability to um, to take a uh, a service like a Uber or a Lyft and say, let's have a concierge concierge aspect to it. Let's make sure that people that might perhaps not be so familiar with a smartphone can dial in and still still book a, a trip. And you can provide that later of service, but that again, that's sort of not not very deep. Where we think the industry is moving is towards again more consideration of that utility, right? So, what are the public assets in play? Streets, sidewalks, electricity. How can those public assets be be um, sort of brought into the process and and be part of the negotiation for how these services are provided and who they're provided for? So, getting back to the plan. First thing we did is we, we took a look, a look at the tools that we have, the information we have, and where there where there's opportunity. And it's a little bit hard to see on uh, at this scale, but the green dots uh, and the uh, the blue and and uh, uh, sort of pink dots are um, existing car share and bike share locations. And you see the blue uh, background is where there's the best opportunity for these services. We think particularly in the cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul. There's uh, there's quite a bit of opportunity, uh, un, sort of unmet, untapped potential for these services, but it's going to require public-private partnership. There's a lot happening right now. You know, I think this is this is well known to everybody, but we see capital investments in terms of transit also sort of seeding um, the potential growth of shared mobility, and of course the region's growing. This is going to put new stresses in terms of uh, congestion. Uh, in terms of uh, greenhouse gas impacts and, and um, vehicle miles traveled. So through our interview process, I think the thing that stood out the most was just the idea that the car is king, that, that there really are very few disincentives to single occupant travel, uh, and that as long as parking is less expensive than transit, it's going to be really tough to convince people to, to, to not, not drive in single occupant vehicles um, to get where they need to get to. We heard a lot about gaps in service, particularly connections to jobs in suburban locations. And we heard about the recent uh, departure of car to go as having kind of a big impact on just the conversation about the extent of these services in terms of their ability to grow, uh, their ability to be sustained in this region, um, and, um, and and also concerns about, in you know, with, with that context, uh, service to, um, to, to a broader uh, range of Minneapolis communities. We heard that um, that there's a pretty deep understanding of um, these these uh, these services from a very small group of folks, and there's a need for broader engagement. Not exactly a roadmap towards how that might happen. So going into sort of what where we set set a goal, set a benchmark. We said we'd like to see 20,000 cars off the road uh, in five years. It's about a 5% mode shift. Um, how does that happen with shared mobility? Well, in conjunction with transit and capital expansion, uh, we think that uh, approximately 600 vehicles, this is one scenario, 600 vehicles and car sharing programs, additional 800 bike share bikes, and in particular, an expansion of the van pool program and in inclusion of, of downtown sites uh, as destinations for van pool can also make a big impact. 
um, and beyond beyond those two sort of numerical goals, right? Um, we we think that there's a real opportunity to put equity, social equity, front and center in a in a plan. That um, again, I can go back to that map, but you saw a pretty small chunk of the city that's served by these services, and you go just outside of downtown, and you have a lot of opportunity. Um, but there needs to be some direction provided to, to how these services might expand into those, those surrounding neighborhoods. So what were our recommendations? Well, we focused on, I'll, I'll just highlight a couple because I know our, our time is short here, but um, so relative to the, the city of Minneapolis, um, I think the first thing I want to highlight is, is the need to stabilize and expand car sharing. Right? That um, with the current uh, arrangement, both in terms of things that are within the control, within the domain of the city, but things so that are beyond that, so for example, state tax policy. Uh, uh, there's really not an environment um, conducive to, to supporting the growth of these services. Um, the reason I shared information on the LA model is we think there's a real opportunity for sort of a hands-on partnership between the city, uh, Minneapolis in particular, but both, 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 both Minneapolis and St. Paul um, in terms of um, Growing these services in a very, um, in a very deliberate way, I think that's going to need to involve um, uh, putting street space into play, on street space, the city's parking assets. These are tools that increasingly we're seeing places like Seattle uh, bring, put, you know, bring into the equation. Um, uh, the, one of the recent conversations we had in Los Angeles was was exactly about this, about using. Parking is an asset towards expanding car sharing into disadvantaged communities, and this actually came from from a, a council member. Another big thing I want to spend some time talking about is the, the transportation demand management um, environment. So uh, it was very clear from a number of interviews, um, follow up conversation we had, follow up conversations we had that there's there is certainly potential in uh, the TMO structure that exists right now. Um, but a need to shift from uh, funding organizations to funding the work that they do. So take a sort of an outcomes-based approach towards um, towards towards transportation demand management. And for, for anybody that's not familiar with TDM, basically this is how, how do we support uh, the use of these services, promote the use of these services, market them, um, sometimes directly through um, subsidies, transit pass programs, things like this. We, we think it can kind of go to the next level beyond that. We've seen some best practices from places like Denver and San Diego and, and again, um, Seattle, uh, where the, in particular the city plays a more hands-on role with transportation demand management. Um, so sometimes that's through a procurement process for some of these services with, with the idea that the TMO, the transportation management organizations, would do that work. Some of that is just a matter of essentially serving as a pass-through or an intermediary for TDM funds uh, as the city of Denver does. So I think there's some, some room for, for, for improvement there. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there. Um, there's a lot of information, but um, take any questions and just say that, again, reiterate that we're kind of in the final chapter of this plan, so to speak. Um, as Kathleen mentioned, uh, with the generous support from McKnight Foundation, we're able to bring this plan forward and implementation. And um, my hope is my hope is we can focus on some focus on some discrete policy areas where there's consensus around um, room for improvement. Thank you. So thank you. Any questions for the presentation? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, is the study the study is still in draft form? You said. Yes. And I think, I, I know that I would love, and I think the other committee members who aren't here um, would, would be happy to see the more detailed sure. version. And I think we all look forward to, to seeing it in its final form too. Um, I guess one question I had is about how we're working with our regional partners, just because so much of this has to do with more of the regional transportation system. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to note that when you were talking about our growth scenarios, I mean, we are catching more of the growth in the central core, but we still just have so much of our household growth in our region that's not that's outside the the city core. And it just when you look at, you know, what is it, six hundred fifty thousand people plus who are going to be added to 
the suburban area outside of our central city core. It just means that in our region, if we're going to plan for greenhouse gas emission targets and those kinds of things, even vehicle miles traveled, wear and tear on our roads, financial investment in our sprawling road system, all that stuff that we really need to rely on our regional partners to help with all, a lot of these more, um, you know, the transit network piece and, um, you know, even I assume like the van pooling would be about getting folks to job destinations that are maybe outside the city. So I don't know, just could talk more about how, how we can help implement this with our partners. Sure. Thank you, Council Members. Good, good question. I, so uh, a, a few things. That we did set, uh, so if you go back to slide, here. so our goal slide here. So we did set sort of a 10 year goal that I think encompasses more of the, the re region, recognizing that city of Minneapolis and St. Paul are, are where, uh, where, where policy change and, and, and funding priorities are likely to take place in a much more short term sense. But we, we do recognize that there's that, that sort of need to bring the, the region as a whole along with this process. Um, two things about just, the, so we presented yesterday at Met Council, um, their transportation committee, and two of the things we highlighted there were um, the need to, um, well, as you said, van pool, but in, in, in addition to that, um, uh, the, the need to focus regional solicitation dollars on these services. So right now, there's a, a, a a sort of a minority set aside among the regional solicitation that does fund transportation demand management and TMO operations. Uh, we think there's an opportunity there to do what some other regions have done in terms of making some of those resources available, not just within the cities, but regionally uh, in a competitive way uh, to, to, to directly fund some of these options through public-private partnerships. Um, and I guess the other thing I would note um, uh, is 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 really just the uh, um, the process that that met met council that Metro Transit has started um, just about a year ago around um, first last mile and reverse commute solutions. So this is an area where there's I think there's an interest from so good example right is the uh, the the bus that was recently started from. Um, I, I'm not sure the precise neighborhood. I should know this uh, from the Somali community. Uh, to a Shakopee, the Amazon Job Center, right? That's that's an issue for for all of us as a as a region, and so there's there's an opportunity there to look at look at how those services are pre being provided, and and kind of bring those private sector solutions into the fold so that it's represented as part of the part of the network. So just two small examples there. Mr. Chair, Committee Member, to the question of how are we working with our regional partners and stakeholders. Um, since the Smart Cities Challenge application was submitted over a year ago, there's been a monthly convening of interested organizations that came together for that application, cities of St. Paul, Minneapolis, MnDOT, um, Nice Ride, and others in the region. That have, and that's been a lot of information sharing and trying to make sure we all are aware of you know, the Metro Transit app and what's happening here and there, um, and then collaborating somewhat too with some see on this effort, but really that um, regional implementation group that is outlined in some C's draft plan will be probably the framework moving forward in terms of how the regional stakeholders move together. And that group hasn't been fully identified yet, but will be in the coming weeks and months. I guess just the last thing I mentioned there is, is also that this five year window coincides with uh, some pretty rapid expansion of capital projects for Metro Transit. And a lot of those areas along the blue and green line extensions um, have very little, if any, shared mobility services. So we think we think as, as the Botano line and Southwest line move forward that there's some discrete opportunities there for expansion. Thank you. I noticed in the, your presentation you mentioned how uh, with an equity lens and getting to communities where the a system might not naturally go, uh, that interventions can be done right and used as an example, the nice ride, the orange bikes. Mm -hmm. uh, could you elaborate a little bit more on what was so right? What are the key elements of that success? So that's, uh, thank you for highlighting that. I, uh, 
what we noticed with nice ride neighborhoods is is that there was a very deliberate process and this is very similar to the process that I, I sort of witnessed firsthand in Los Angeles is it's, it just takes a lot of time right and you have to make sure that you're bringing uh, community-based organizations in very very early on in the process and that you are prepared uh, for the results maybe being a little bit different than what you originally intended right so nice ride neighborhoods is not a bike sharing program it works and I think that, that that's kind of a, a theme for for this plan in, in a lot of different ways. Van pooling is not something that we traditionally think of as shared mobility, but it's something that we see much larger numbers um, from other sort of peer peer communities. Um, and so it's something that we, we chose to lift up. So I think, yeah, if there's lessons from Nice Ride Neighborhoods, it's that they, they, they put a lot of time into the front end. It wasn't just about dropping in more bikes. Um, or hitting a number, although obviously you, you saw number is important to us, mm -hmm. um, but but being deliberate about that process and, and open to solutions being different than than perhaps how we normally think of these systems. Thank you. And sort of highlights the uh, in some ways the value of this overall study, bringing a very localized context to these broader trends. Uh, I, I can't imagine the immeasurable value of that. I know uh, Director Hutchinson. Uh, Director Wirches, our planning division, we're looking at the edge of a lot of these conversations uh, as a national conversation unfolds, but to have something that we can tie specifically, uh, I imagine, is a great tool. Mr. Chair and uh, Councilmember Bender, it is a great tool, and the strategies that are outlined, there are a number of strategies for the region, and then I, I really appreciate, and I know you will too, that SUMSI has actually parsed out the strategies that are most relevant for cities and the city of Minneapolis and we're grateful to have some of that to help us advance our work so that we're not only working around the edges that we're really um, advancing advancing this study. Thank you. Councilmember Bender. Thank you Mr. Chair. Just a quick note too that um, probably goes without saying but I just think we all really appreciate the car to go um, car sharing piece of the work and look forward to those recommendations and details about how we can help to foster that service in our city. I know a lot of my constituents and others in the wards particularly, you know, that are pretty transit rich. I had a lot of constituents who sold their cars and were using that service and now it's been a real gap in their personal transportation needs and it wasn't, I mean, it's people of all ages. I had a lot of actually a lot of retired couples who had sold their car, second car or all their cars um, who were car free and were using car to go. So I think sometimes we have a stereotype of who is car light or car free in our city. And um, anyway, there are a lot of people choosing to be to reduce their car ownership because of that service. And now, again, you know, I, I really heard from a lot of people that that was a big loss for them. So I think we're all looking forward to trying to figure out, figure out that piece. For sure, I'll just I'll just say, uh, thank you, Council Member. I'll, I'll just say that that um, there's a lot of interest in bringing I want to say bringing back car to go, but but reintroducing some some form of one way service. Um, that that's a, a a piece of the pie that 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 should be included in the mix. Um, but just to be very frank about the the situation, is a very very sort of number of reasons for that company's departure and a, a theme that we heard pretty consistently throughout this process was that the private sector is looking to public sector leadership uh, in in bringing these services back and even in a, a larger larger community like like our work in Los Angeles um, you know bringing a new mode of service into town in a way that was done equitably required not only a lot of time but also a lot of investment um, in terms of um, the Department of Transportation staffing in that case, right? And um, uh, that means looking differently at the, the solicitation process, perhaps not looking towards requests for proposals, but looking at RFQs and looking at even expressions of interest preceding that process and taking the time to do that. Um, but it's 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 time intensive and resource resource intensive work in terms of in terms of uh, not not only you know our sort of our our guidance, but but also public sector staff as well. So. I think that's a key thing to think about. Thank you. Any closing questions or final comments? Uh, seeing none, uh, since the consultant is only in town today, the presentation for this item will take place, but no action will be taken until the adjourned meeting on Thursday. 
Committee members not in attendance will have the opportunity to view the meeting video prior to the committee acting on the item uh, at the adjourned meeting. So therefore, this meeting is adjourned to Thursday, July 13th, 2017, 1.30 p.m., at which the committee will move on all agenda items. So we'll have an irregularly scheduled meeting due to lack of quorum. And with that, we are adjourned.